welcome to today's session. Uh, we're very honored to have Jim Lanzone here. So Jim's the CEO of Yahoo, uh, the trusted digital guide for hundreds of millions of people globally, helping them achieve their goals online through its portfolio of iconic brands from Yahoo News to Yahoo Finance to Yahoo Sports. Over 25 years of leadership and entrepreneurial experience in technology and media, Jim has a proven track record of driving growth and innovation. And prior to joining Yahoo, Jim was CEO of Tinder, the most popular dating app in the world. <laughs> what? <laughs> Why is that funny? <laughs> All right, that, that seems to be the point people want me to stop the introduction. <laughs> so Jim joined Tinder after nearly a decade as president and CEO of CBS Interactive, a top 10 global internet company with brands ranging from CBS All Access, now that's Paramount Plus, to CNET. Jim was also named the chief digital office, the first digi chief digital officer in the history of CBS Corporation. Jim joined CBS in 2011 when he purchased Clicker Media, an internet video search and programming guide where he was founder and CEO. Previously, Jim held several leadership positions, including CEO at Ask.com. He holds a BA from UCLA. Uh, that's the Crosstown University from <laughs> USC. It's okay. And you went there. I was going to, but you went there first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he's a proud 98 JD MBA graduate of Goizueta Emory University. Congratulations. Thank you. So, Jim, I feel a little overdressed. This is this is <laughs> New York formal. Uh, we, I was just in New York yesterday. That's Yahoo, yeah, the, the, the sneakers are, are the required dress code in, in New York now. I was just at an event last night with the president and uh, uh, in New York, and poor President Fenvis was dressed up like a university president is supposed to be dressed up with a tie and suit and. And everyone else was sort of this level of formality. So uh, he, I think he'll learn for next time. So. Well, you have to join the tech industry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it, it's, it's interesting. We were just commenting on the fact that we have this room and then we have two overflow rooms. The overflow rooms actually filled up before this room. It's like t today's generation, actually, yeah. they're scared to be in a room in the same room as someone. They would r rather do it remotely. So, yeah. uh, but I know we have a great turnout here. Uh, so thank you for coming along, Jim. Uh, yeah, and I know yeah. you have... You have a hard assignment after visiting with us. You have to go to the masters and and, <laughs> and deal with all of that angst yep. uh, out there. So we we we. Not only that, I'm meeting two of my classmates from from Goizueta there. Yeah. So um, actually, they're all all three of us were JD MBAs. There you um, go. So, but all 98 graduates. We were actually, by the way, the first class in this building. Our first year was at the other. You guys never know what this is. The Rich Building. <laughs> Um, yeah, we and, put the uh, economists in that building now. Yeah, okay. So, um, yeah. So, right over here, Richard Wave. We were we were co-founders of our very first company together, right out of Guizueta, and did it out of I guess out of this building, right? It's a pretty entrepreneurial place, man. <laughs> and then then we we're also televising this to Ben Kaczynski's class, and I understand that you were a TA of his when you were here. It was and Jeff's and and Jeff. <laughs> Well, uh, Jeff, we, Jeff by the way, they had the first question that came in from the overflow room, which was, why Tinder? <laughs> <laughs> like, already? Okay. All right. That isn't the first question you always get. <laughs> okay, well, let, let's make a start. And I have a few questions here, but usually the best questions come from the audience. So I'll, I'll ask a few, and then we'll open it up for okay. questions from the audience uh, and just go from there. So you've had a fascinating career leading several media industry companies. So what exactly motivated you to join Yahoo as a CEO and what is it you're hoping to achieve over your tenure? Obviously Yahoo's had a sort of up and down trajectory, now it's back on an upward trajectory. So tell us a little bit about that background and why you yeah. joined. Um, I mean, so look, Yahoo is older than this building. It's, it's 29 years old, it'll be 30 next year. It's older than some of the people um, in this room. It definitely, it's definitely older than the students. Um, Look, in the, in the, in the, now that you ex extend out the history of the internet, the, it's only three years older than Google. I mean, it's actually, you know, it's not as ancient as people would think. Um, but it had been through a lot. And I, I've had a, you know, we could talk about it, but, a, you know, kind of an uh, unusual career path uh, for all the different places that I, I went. 
But one thing that was very common was I was, I was a part of, of several turnarounds. And I always had my eye on Yahoo. It was, you know, it, it was um, you know, pretty much from the minute that they flicked the lights on for Google to become the search engine on Yahoo, which happened in June of 2000, which was a tragic strategic error. Um, interestingly done for the right reasons, if you, if you go back and understand why they did it. Um, and, and search then went to Google. The company spent the next 17 years as a public company trying to figure out you know, what its purpose was, how it could survive, um, and having a hard time. And then it was bought by Verizon uh, in, in, uh, in 2016, 17 time period. Um, and so that was four or five more years. You know. And so by the time we acquired it, um, the private equity firm that, that brought me in, which was September of 2021, I mean, it had been through a lot. Um, and to me, this was, you know, the best possible turnaround uh, bone, you know, they had amazing bones to work with, which was hundreds of millions of users a month, had been a top five internet property every month since the beginning of the internet. For every month for 29 straight years, Yahoo has been top five. Uh, and yet we were able to buy it from Verizon for only $5 billion, right? And all the major internet companies are all worth over a trillion. And so the, you know, if you just looked at that, you'd say, you know, we could really do something with that. And having been through turnarounds before and kind of understanding what the, um, you know, what the framework and what the blueprint for that should look like, um, to me, this was the one. This was, this was the one that I just, I knew I really, really wanted to go do. So I, I had a great job at the time, but I, I, uh, I went running towards this one. All right. Fantastic. All right. Last time I visited with you, you showed me around your new studio. Uh, incredibly <laughs> impressive uh, structure there. Yeah. Um, how is that business going? And 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 sort of is it is it becoming a larger fraction of Yahoo's business? Yahoo fin That's the Yahoo Finance studio. So um, it is interesting about CEOs. They they, they all like stopping by and being on camera and, and, and doing interviews. <laughs> um, and so it competes with CNBC and Bloomberg and others at, at Yahoo Finance, which is still the, you know, and, and this kind of also goes back to the, uh, the idea of, of why Yahoo. It's, it's again, not only is it that big overall, but we're number one in finance, number two in sports, number one in news. This is by total traffic. Number two in email, personal email after Gmail. Um, we're still number three in search, believe it or not, which is still, you know, obviously a huge business. Um, but Yahoo Finance is one of the most important. And next week, we're actually launching uh, uh, out of beta a brand new version of Yahoo Finance. Um, and that is just the start of every single one of the products that we operate. We'll have a brand new version sometime in the next four or five months. Um, some, some of which are already live in beta. I actually got a text today from a guy I used to work with at Ask Jeeves years ago. He's now the CEO of ZocDoc. And he, he was like, I think I'm in A-B test. I have the new version of your homepage, yeah. <laughs> uh, which literally like 0.1% of people would see. Uh, he's like, it's a thousand times better than, than the old one. I'm like, yep, can't, <laughs> can't wait to get that out there. Um, but I'll also quickly say that um, Yahoo Finance is a little more media oriented and I think the rest of what, what we do. If, if you really think about what Yahoo is, uh, you know, we operate massively scaled products that are helping people. You said the achieve your goals thing. It sounded very, uh, I think that's probably from my LinkedIn or something. It's very like templated. Um, but it is what we are trying to do every day, which is people from the beginning of when Yahoo existed, it said uh, the, the very first one that they launched, well, first one said Jerry and David's Guide to the World, Guide to Mosaic, <laughs> uh, which is the predecessor to, uh, uh, to Netscape. And then it was J uh, Jerry and David's Guide to the World Wide Web, always under construction. Then they renamed it Yahoo. Mm -hmm. And if you go back to that original, you know, what it was launched for to be this guide to the internet, well, what that means in 2024 has changed drastically from 1995 when it was helping you find websites. It was actually what our startup did too in the 90s. A lot of people in the 90s were trying to do that, um, helping you, you find which websites you should use. Today, it's about goal achievement. It's about you're coming here to get something done. In finance, it's to make money or save money. In news, it's to you know, find out your daily logistics of what's going on in the world or what's happening to you. For mail, it's, you're obviously trying to get things done. It might be for school, it might be for work. Um, in sports, I actually think of it that way too. It's like helping enable your fandom. That could be fantasy or it could be gambling, uh, which is now legal. 
Um, and, uh, and that's what we're trying to do across the portfolio. So while we have video on Yahoo Finance, the majority of what we do, I would say, is more product and technology, you know, as, as like a tool for people, people to accomplish things on a daily basis. Okay, thank you. And, you know, as you mentioned, you've had a sort of an unusual trajectory of, of different places that you've been to between sort of Ask and Clicker Media, CBS Interactive, Tinder. Tell us, did, what sort of background did that give you for coming into this role? Were there things that they that helped out? Are there other things you, you've learned along the way uh, uh, since you joined Yahoo? Um, yeah, I mean, a ton. I, I really am a bad, uh, you know, I, nothing I did in my career was planned out. <laughs> you know, we had our startup. We, it went great for a while. The market crashed. It hit us really hard. So we basically, you know, we were lucky to land that at Ask Jeeves at the time, which was, um, you know, which was a very popular search engine with a cartoon butler on it <laughs> in the 90s and in early 2000s. Um, but we kind of had a Camelot period there for seven years where I joined as the head of product. Um, by the time I left, I was CEO. Um, just kind of having running product, running product for a company like that, you wind up kind of running a lot of what's going on. And then we turned that around so well that my boss got recruited to be the head of Microsoft's entire internet division. So I was battlefield promoted into his job. Um, I then started another company that was acquired. I was hired as CEO with, with that deal. So, um, so really as it's gone along, I've, I've, um, I've just kind of jumped from thing to thing along the way. There was never any kind of like, I wanted, I wanted to, I did it on purpose. Um, but what's wound up happening is for 25 years, I've, I've worked solely in consumer internet companies, largely in, in a lot of cases uh, in search or in things related to that. Definitely a lot in online media. I was part of the search wars, the streaming wars. Uh, and, and at Yahoo, there's almost no division of what we do that I haven't already run before, you know, some, some version of it, a past company. Um, the only one is email, which we actually built a version of it, Ask and never launched. <laughs> so I even kind of had looked at that uh, for a bit. Um, so, you know, it, it, having done turnarounds before, it prepared me for that. Having understanding how to grow a consumer internet company, because um, my job at the end of the day is growth and, and, and consumer internet that's growth in your user base, and then that leads to the growth in revenue and profitability. Um, and, uh, and so this is really like the kind of the culmination of all that for me, it kind of brings it all together. Were there any things you came across at Yahoo that were sort of different challenges than you'd expected, or was it pretty much sort of the sort of, the sort of thing you'd handled before, and it was just a, maybe a different scale? Or? Yeah, I'd say it's more that it was—it was almost exactly what I expected, at it, but at a different scale. Um, meaning, I knew it was going to take a while. You know, this was not something where that you would be able to to get from A to B overnight. Um, you know, we had to restructure the company. We've brought in an amazing new team, which includes people we've promoted from within at the company, but also people that we brought in um, from other companies. Um, yeah, we have a whole new operating structure put in place where we essentially have general managers who are the CEOs of their businesses um, across sports and finance and news and mail and all these products. Um, and we've had to do some transformational work, like we, we had to shut down a huge part of our revenue, our ad tech division. We also own a, a big ad tech uh, group. Um, that caused us to actually have to reduce the company by 20%. Um, not in cost cutting, but in, in a, we're not gonna be in those businesses anymore. And so unfortunately we had to part ways with a lot of people. So there was a lot of that groundwork that got laid in years one and two, but then all these amazing new people and new product people and new heads of engineering really started to cook about nine months ago. And that's why this year we now have all these amazing, amazing new versions of all these products that'll be coming to market um, you know, over the next few months. Um, and again, by the time that happens, you'll be well over two years, you know, two and a half years into this. So it does take a while, you know, to get moving. Do you have any of those people you can share to help us with our website? <laughs> we could do it with a little help, I think. It's funny, we used to have a thing called Webmaster. <laughs> that was a real job that people would put on their resumes in, in the 90s and 2000s. I almost put it on my Twitter bio that I was Webmaster <laughs> CEO, and somebody taught me out of it. I might still do it, actually. <laughs> you, you make a good point about 
nothing you've done having been specifically planned out. And I, I think it's important to talk to our students about this because I, I, I run into this a lot when I talk to a lot of our successful alums all around the country that I hear the story again and again and again that almost invariably their path has been a non-linear one that sort of they'd expected to do one thing, maybe the financial crisis hit and it hit, sent them in another direction and it turned out to be a really positive direction to go in. And yeah. I feel like sometimes when you're 22 years old, you, th you think you have to have the whole thing planned out and if, if something goes a, a little bit awry, then it's a disaster. When I think the reality is that you discover new things and, and uh, no one direction is going to be the direction you take the whole, whole lot of your life. Yeah, I, I would recommend a good video. Um, Bill Gurley, who was one of my old investors, who's a big venture capitalist, did an hour-long talk at the University of Texas Business School. It's on YouTube about how to find your passion and what you should do with your life. He might turn into a book. Um, yeah, I mean, look, by the way, by the time we, st I mean, I had no, I really had never had a real job until we started our company coming out of school. <laughs> um, the previous summer, and this could be a clue, but I, I, I answered, um, it might have been an email uh, or whatever we had at the school at the time, where you had to go to the library and log in uh, to check your messages, um, <laughs> which I mostly used to talk shit about college basketball <laughs> um, with some professors. But uh, I answered something that asked for interns that summer for, for internet companies. And I had no qualifications, but I followed up with that professor and I said, I use the internet a lot. I'm like, <laughs> I went to UCLA, I love media, I'm all, I'm all over this. And so I interviewed with all of them and, and the one I picked was, was here in Atlanta. Uh, it was a really old school, uh, it's hard to even call it digital, it was called Information America. And they provided public records over like dial up to lawyers and businesses and private investigators and, and stuff and uh the guy the ceo's named buck goldstein and he was actually in a, i think he was a professor was he an adjunct professor here and he just took me under his wing that summer and he he let me build their first website um so by the time at the and, and including all the ads all the pr all the like every everything so by the end of that summer i was like oh this is easy so when rit and roger are other classmate were starting this company, I was like, oh, I could do that. <laughs> so we did. And that, you know, that just kind of kicked it off. But um, I gave the same advice, you know, and I, I loved startups, which is why I eventually did it. It's weird. I've wound up in bigger companies as time has gone on because I still think of myself as a early stage person. But I've probably spent, you know, well over half my career in large companies at this point. But, um, but I gave the same advice to my son who just graduated last year. Um, he's, he's a programmer. And he did a bunch of internships during high school and college for startups. And all of his classmates were going to places like Dell and I don't know, because he, he, he was in Texas, um, you know, and Apple and Google. It's okay. um, and uh, and I, I really encouraged him to go do a startup. So he was employee number six at a, um, as a back-end developer at an AI startup. So he's not doing AI. He's actually just building all the back-end stuff. Um, and he was just at the homecoming last weekend and he said that a ton of his friends from last year don't like their job and he loves his job. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so I, don't know, I was able to at least show him, you know, say, you know, but he should follow his passion for what he, he likes to do. Great, thank you. On the, um, you, you mentioned AI, so obviously, uh, and a, a massive topic at the moment, and um, not as exciting as Tinder, but but it's it's, it's up there. Um, tell us about the impact that that's had uh, on your industry, uh, both for Yahoo specifically and what you're seeing in the industry in general. It's having tremendous impacts in the education industry, every industry you can imagine. Um, and we, we've started a task force at Goy's Weta to try to just try to get some sort of handle yeah, on that. Yeah, you have it. to do it. Um, but, but tell us about what, what's your experience, what have you seen, you bringing in some great, great new people, you said, so. Yeah, um, although I've not hired one head of AI yet, um, and probably won't, and I mean, it's interesting, it really came out of nowhere in November of 22, um, 
I think even, I mean, I've seen, so I was at OpenAI Open AI last week. They had a partner um, conference for a couple hundred people. And, and they showed the text that was sent the night before, or the Slack post from the night before, that basically told half the company they were launching the next day and saying, it's no big deal, probably only researchers will use it. <laughs> and it changed the world, um, and especially for the people in that room. And, uh, and so it really has come on fast. And for my first year and a half at the company, um, it was all about crypto and it was about Web3 and blockchain and all this stuff. And so, you know, you go from, from that to this, which really is going to define the next, I don't know, I mean, I, I've heard it compared to, it's, it's almost as big as the internet itself from 30 years ago. And we're right at the beginning. And Yahoo is not leading the way in we're not building our own large language model. Um, we didn't raise, you know, billions of dollars uh, to build uh, to build one, um, and we have, we have a very interesting place in the world, though, which is that as one of the top five properties with hundreds of millions of users and, and who are relying on us every day in these categories, every single one of those products needed AI, what AI could do right away. So we partnered with, with all of them. We already have a deep partnership with Microsoft, so we're, we're partnering with them on some that we've partnered directly with OpenAI, we've partnered directly with Google, um, with Anthropic. And what we're doing is, starting a year ago, we started bringing AI into every product. So email, it would help you, I mean, now everything is doing this, but we launched it about a year ago, um, helping you write the email, edit the email, make it shorter, make it longer, make it funnier, make it more serious, search better, et cetera. In fantasy sports, it was doing everything from helping set your lineup to writing smack-talking emails <laughs> that you would get on Monday critiquing the performance of your team uh, you know, that weekend. In Yahoo Finance, it's, it's, it's gonna be guiding you uh, for your investments, uh, which is one of the top you know, one or two use cases that, that we have. So, and obviously we're bringing into search as well. So every product we have, we have has a version that we'll, we'll rely on AI for. And, and that's just the start, you know, where we can go from that. You know, I was at a smaller search engine that innovated a lot. I, have, I always have like dreams of what, what we might do in this space, but you can't do everything at once, so we're kind of just early and getting started. But I think we have an interesting vantage point for it. Great. Um, I, I want to open it up to the audience in a second, but I, I, one, one last question. So if you were to think back to your 22-year-old self graduating from UCLA, I presume, um, and thinking about sort of the decisions you made, the actions you took at that point, is there any advice you would give yourself uh, <laughs> from that, that period uh, that you might do, do differently or that you wish you had thought about a little more? It's hard. I, you know, I really had no mentors. I, I, I hadn't, I promise you this is true, I had not read the business section when I came here before. And a classmate of mine from the law school was like, it's just like reading the sports page, just for, for companies. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh. And it, it kind of made sense. I, um, I would definitely do it. I, I, when I left UCLA, I took a year off, and I went and lived in Barcelona in Europe and had an amazing time. I would definitely do that again. <laughs> that, was, that was really smart. Um, and then I went to law school uh, at Emory, not, not knowing what I wanted to do. You know, my dad had been a lawyer. My mom had been a teacher. Um, before, you know, the family business for my dad's family growing up was a fish and ship store in Harlem for 50 years. Um, my mom's mom was an operator, uh, literally the kind where you would plug it in. <laughs> um, I had no context for any of this. Um, so when I had classmates from the law school who were JD and BA, and I started reading the business section <laughs> and understanding it, and then the internet industry started taking off, right, as that started happening in 94, 95, 96, um, a light bulb went on. And then coming here, it was like, I always say this, it was like seeing in color. It was just, everything made sense. Even the HR class, I swear to God, made sense. Uh, even though, you know, d d decision information analysis will never make sense <laughs> to me. <laughs> I had to get a lot of help from classmates on that one. <laughs> Patrick Noonan was not an easy teacher. Uh, but, um, yeah, but everything else made sense. And, uh, and so I don't know. I don't know I could have done it any other way, really. I, but you know what's funny is if I hadn't gone to law school, 
Um, it was very clear once I got there that I was not, I probably shouldn't be there. Unlike my wife who became a prosecutor and was a badass <laughs> and just, you know, was a great lawyer, loved being a lawyer. My dad loved being a lawyer. It just didn't resonate as much with me. Um, but, you know, I probably would have, it's so funny, I, I bet you I would have wound up as like an editor at Yahoo. Mm -hmm. I would have been helping pick out websites, which is so funny because it's exactly what our startup did. <laughs> this would have done it three years earlier, you know. Great, great. So let me, let me open it up to the audience now. Um, I don't, do we have a mic or anything that's, that's going around? Okay, so who wants to ask the first question? Okay, we've got one there and one there. So let's do that one and then the, over to this one. Hello? Is yeah. that a Microsoft? Yeah. Is that an Azure? Yeah. Is that, okay. Uh, yeah, Azure computer. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so you're going to answer all the AI questions. Great. Yeah. I'll point them your way. <laughs> do you work at Microsoft or do you go to school here? No, uh, both. Evening MBA. Okay. <laughs> Um, look, I mean, I, 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 didn't, I didn't say this earlier. The most important thing any of us can do as managers, but definitely if you're the CEO and there, there's no other you know, person after you, is hire well, right? And for this company, that meant bringing in people who are product leaders first to run every division. Um, and if you go down the list, you know, my Ryan Spoon who runs sports, he was the head of product at ESPN for eight years. Tappan Bod, who runs finance, he was not only was he the he was the CEO of Nerd Wallet, and but he was the head of product for Yahoo, for Yahoo Home, and and a bunch of that in the uh, in the 2010 period. Um, go down the list. You know, my the person I just brought in to run mail, the two people I brought in to run mail, the head of product was my head of product at Tinder. So you should ask him more. <laughs> How do you talk him into doing mail? And then the other one built Paramount Plus and ran it until two months ago and that entire product for 13 years. So these are product first leaders. If you have that, they will adapt to the changing landscape. Um, and there's no suit, there's no business person who doesn't, you know, can't really be in their shoes to understand what they need to do. And, and the best thing I can do is enable them and not try to micromanage them, you know, along the way. And I know enough about product to know that I, I should not be bossing everybody around on product all day. Things go bad when I, when I do that. Um, it, if they're up and running, I can kind of needle them a bit and send in like, why is this font so small? Which I did send that in today <laughs> in one of the newsletters. <laughs> um, uh, but that, to me, that's how you stay nimble um, in, the, in each one of these, these businesses. I, I'd say at the corporate level, it's gonna be to be as light as we can. Um, I, I kind of think about as federal and state is the way I call it. Every, every one of these businesses is a state. They have their own governor, you know, and, and if it, Tinder's an example, but also a search engine or Twitter or others, those are one product companies. So the CEO can be the chief product officer basically, but in my company, it's a portfolio of businesses. So our job in, in, at the federal level is to give them leverage, but as little as possible to let them kind of be flexible and do their jobs. Right. Question over here. My name is Aziz, and I'm a software study analyst. My question for you as a former CEO of Tinder. What do you think of the recent five hundred dollar subscription in Tinder? Is it worth it or not? <laughs> <laughs> You know, the funny thing is when I got there, I got all these texts from people and they're like, hey, can you get me into the secret version of Tinder? <laughs> and I'm like, what is that? Because look, I, I met Shannon here. We've been married 27 years. We've been together for 30, lived together for 30. Our first house was in the Highlands. <laughs> uh, and um, I've never used a dating service. It actually turns out not to be the hardest product to manage um, because if you just use a dummy account, you just see how it works. You kind of don't need to use it twice. <laughs> you can kind of go off of demos and, and after that. Um, and uh, so 
Uh, but it turned out that product did not exist. There was no secret version of Tinder. People wanted to pay $10,000 for that one. Mm -hmm. And there are versions of this. Has anyone heard of Raya? Raya is the one where, like, you know, Ben Affleck, well, I guess he's married to JLo now. But, like, <laughs> you know, famous people are, are on Raya. Um, I think it's a pretty small business overall. And I, I think, unless you're kind of, um, you know, maybe someone that they would recognize, which I don't know if you are yet or not, <laughs> what you did in crypto. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's who that product is, is largely for. The, here's the thing, it does pay to, uh, to pay a, a dating service, especially if you're a guy, because it gets you to the front, it gets you kind of to the front of the line to be considered faster. That's the thing that happens in that, uh, to that industry. Because the problem is otherwise the liquidity, it's, the liquidity of that marketplace is so dense, it could take two weeks for someone to see, to see you at all. Um, to even be considered due to the dynamics of, of it. So I don't know about 500, but the base subscription is probably pretty worth it. <laughs> So, do you think statisticians should pay extra to get further up in the line? <laughs> it all depends. Yeah. <laughs> Be yourself is what I also <laughs> say on that. Be yourself. And don't wear sunglasses in your photos. <laughs> Here we go. Some and don't say hey <laughs> if someone matches with you. Don't just say hey. <laughs> say something interesting. <laughs> okay, I got a, a question here. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, um, well, there's a couple things in there. It's true, and I, again, I don't know what everyone's experience here is to know what you meant by experience of private equity companies, but they don't have the best reputation always of um, you know, being friendly to management, let's just say. And I've just had a great experience with the one I work with. Uh, and I always say if things go badly, maybe that won't be true. <laughs> um, but they've been amazing partners for us since the minute I met them, which was obviously before I started. Um, and you know, I have found this everywhere I've gone and I made the mistake a long time ago. The, the first time I went into a turnaround of telling everybody right away what I thought and how lame I thought things were and how I was here to fix it. And it, it you know, so you don't come into a, a company like that. You, you take a few months, you go into listening to her, you understand that from the outside, you, you cannot possibly have enough empathy to understand what is actually going on inside a company. What they've been through, what the data really says, who's really using it the way you think they are from the outside, why certain decisions were made. So like, especially here knowing it was gonna take a while, I had the luxury of, of taking my time. So I didn't come in guns blazing and, and, um, and, and, and you know, changing everything right away. It took, it took six to eight months for me to kind of start really doing that. And then by that time, I'd been speaking every two weeks in our company at all hands. You know, they'd understood what I thought the priorities should be. By that point, what I thought, where we'd gone off, off, you know, off the rails a bit. Um, and what you find at that point is some people think you're telling them there's no Santa Claus <laughs> and are mad uh, and probably won't, don't want to be a part of it, whether it's because, you know, I usher them out or they opt out. Um, I got, by the way, I did get really lucky my first year in a way, which was that it was, um, uh, it was the great resignation, if anyone, under, and our competitors were hiring our employees, I don't think without checking how good they were, at double or triple the salary. So we were actually able to get let a lot of people who didn't believe in what we were trying to do, they left on their own that first year. Um, but you know, I do find like people will, um, a lot of people are, will, will say, thank God you're finally here and, and, and they get what you're saying and they run towards the fire with you and other people kind of opt out. That definitely is part of it. Um, but they, they, you let them down gently is, is the right way to do it. <laughs> I can hear you. change in the company. How 
how do you normally navigate around the people aspect of it? How do you communicate change if you're not receptive to them? What's your formula and handling situations like with other CEOs? It's um, a good question. So if you hear, how do you, like kind of how do you handle the communication side and, and the persuasion side of, of getting everybody to follow you when you're making the big changes? Um, I think it takes multiple bites of the apple to go at it. They have to, in everything you do communicates. You have to realize that. I will tell a funny story of where I heard that line, which was at our startup. We, for some insane reason, hired the CMO of Coke, was he the existing or the former? CMO of Coca-Cola. This was the guy who changed it to New Coke <laughs> as, a, as a consultant for us. And he was um, some just super flamboyant person. He drove a black Porsche convertible and he wrote yeah. books and he was, he was a very prominent guy. Sergio Zima, is, he was Mexican. And he, and he I, I guess he called our, our little office in the Highlands and he got the answering machine and it was classical music. And he calls me, he's all mad, and he's like, Jim Lanzong, don't you know that everything communicates? You have to change that music. <laughs> and then he, told, then he gave me a lecture about how I had to aspire to own a black convertible Porsche. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, you know, it's true, everything does. And, and sometimes it's the stone cutter, you know, it's the hundredth time is when the stone breaks and everything leading up to that point. And so from my very first all hands, where I didn't use any teleprompter, I didn't have any canned remarks, I just t spoke from the heart to these guys about why I was there and what I believed in. And then we hired those people who are authentic people, who were domain experts, who are high empathy and EQ people. Um, and then they started kind of, you know, talking about what the mission was and what we were trying to do. That by the time you actually get to proc roadmaps, they're gonna change things. Um, you know, I think that goes over pretty smoothly because then they're all on board with you. But I will say that like my first few weeks, I took, I took one of the engineering teams out to beers and the only question I got was, are you gonna change the benefits program? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't think these guys are gonna be at the front, of, are gonna be helping, <laughs> helping manufacture change very quickly, you know? Um, so it takes two to tango, I think. Here we got one back here. You, you just, I can hear you. Yeah, and then there's the next one over there. Right, thank you. Uh, I'm Odin, you can call me OG. I'm in my first certified year of business analytics. Uh, so regarding your recent acquisition of Cisco, uh, what are your thoughts on the acquisition? Yeah. Uh, what is Yahoo's interplay with Cisco? And how are you integrating Cisco? So if anyone doesn't, we acquired a company last week that um, was founded by the founders of Instagram. And their next project that they spent three years on was an AI and machine learning driven um, news product. I don't think anyone used Artifact. Does anyone know, did anyone know it? Um, it? It was very popular in Silicon Valley. It kind of read your mind and uh, gave great summaries and, and just a great news feed that was really levels above anybody else, including us. So, um, but interestingly, and probably it takes a billionaire to make this decision, um, right, none of you raised your hands. <laughs> and uh, they probably had a half million users, but it was none of you. And, um, and they understood that. And so instead of just putting more money towards it, even though in Silicon Valley people love this product, they announced they're gonna shut down. Um, I'd never seen that before. And I called him, I called Kevin Sistrom, who's the founder, and, and I asked him what he was gonna do with it, and if he, would, if he wanted to sell it to me. Um, as like an asset purchase. And um, long story short, we wound up acquiring the company. Uh, 10 other people inquired to acquire it too. But, so we're not acquiring the company, no employees are coming. Kevin and Mike are gonna be advisors to us to integrate the technology, teach us how it works, teach us how their machine learning and how their algorithms work, um, and train my team up, the team that did the acquisition. So Kat Downs Mulder, I hired, she was the head of product for the Washington Post and she's the GM of news. And so her team is in charge of um, building that out. So what you'll see is the new Yahoo News, which we have a new UI for that's coming, on the back end will be a lot better because it will essentially be artifact by the time it gets out there. Yeah. Okay, there was a question up here. Quickly, I wanna thank you for being on the show. Yesterday, my name is Kyle, I'm a DBA student in Baltimore. 
what can we do for you? Like, as someone who sort of took the path that maybe less traveled by, you didn't go the typical rule with wide optionality and to a certain extent an entrepreneur right away. What advice do you have for when you consider like, this is like the first job is gonna be a huge impact and maybe we're scared to take a rule with less traveled by with less optionality. Um, everyone can hear that, I think? Um, well, so halfway I'd say what I kind of said before. And the second is well, something I haven't mentioned that I, I believe in, which is I think you should do your best for what that first job should be. And, and but I also realize all the internships you're doing, it's like the, they are important because they do give you something to hang your hat on for what that first job should be. But then once you get that, I kind of feel like you're gonna, you should be in a spot where you can see and learn what all the different facets of business are. Maybe you should be in sales, maybe you should be in finance, maybe you should be in product. Um, and, and you won't know until you see it, right? Um, and people do move around. And, 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 and that's a great thing that the MBA school is for because you know, for me, it was, it was my pivot out of law school and having no job <laughs> and not knowing what I wanted to do. And it turned out you know, I wanted to be a tech entrepreneur. Um, but I saw a lot of other people, you know, um, shift courses. And so a lot of people came out of consulting into something else. A lot of people wanted to go into consulting, especially in the 90s. Um, that was a big one. Um, you know, my, get, my guess is Rhett probably thought he was going to like, because uh, uh, he was our CFO, like a, a you know, big accounting firm or something. And instead he wanted to be an entrepreneur for 25 years. <laughs> so you get these pivots. You don't know until you start to do it. Um, you know, so I just think you gotta get moving. Don't, I wouldn't overthink the first job too, too much. Yeah. And when you get there, don't start bossing everybody around. L <laughs> listen, learn. <laughs> Quit question here. Hi, Joe. Hi. My name is Patrice. I'm a current first year MBA. Great. I used to work at Apple, and I'll say since I left, my speaker game has gotten worse. <laughs> really? <laughs> I love those if you're Nike. But Stock X, um, come on. <laughs> Those who are starting that journey, how they can use their platform to kind of learn and start. On the investing side? Or, uh, yeah. Um, well, it's funny you say that because, um, again, I always say I could kind of at this point drop down and do everybody's job in the company except the CFO. <laughs> you don't want me in that job. Um, and I've been really lucky to have some, some great ones. Um, so I'm probably the wrong person, you know, on that on that side of things. Um, I will, so, um, but you're, you know, you're off to the right start by being, by being here. And I would just say what I said before, which is like, it's, I think it's pretty clear like what the roadmap would be to a career in finance, you know, whether you're going into corporate finance or you're going to banking. And that's, that's an easy one to know what you need to do to, to get started. And then, you know, just like being a lawyer, a lot of people bail later, they, they figure out it's not for them. And then some people know it's absolutely for them. And, they wind up in the big short or something. But uh, <laughs> um, so anyway, so um, on the investing side, Yahoo Finance is exactly what you should use because it's, it's free unless you want to sign up for one of the subscription tiers. Um, it's not 500 uh, a month. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, what do they call it? What's that level called? Okay, now. <laughs> it happened after, I, I know what the project was called. I know what the code name was internally. Because uh, they were working on it when I was there, but I don't know what they. I can't say it. I can't say it. It wasn't. It wasn't cheesy, and it wasn't you know sexual. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, so anyway. But um, but yeah. I mean, I know people who run, and I get emails all the time for people who basically run their business off of Yahoo Finance, the way other people do off of Bloomberg terminals which has led me to realize we should probably have a cheaper, lower tiered version of, of them uh, that we do sell. So that, that might be something that we would launch at some point. Um, so there's another one called TradingView, uh, which is European, um, that is kind of a middle ground right now. It's over 200 a month, but um, ours would be cheaper. <laughs> what about fantasy? Nobody wants fantasy advice? <laughs> I'm really good at fantasy sports. <laughs> There and, and then there. Yeah. Hi, my name is Josh. I graduated 25. Thanks for taking time to speak with us. 
Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's an excellent question. <laughs> Fascinating. Jeff, Jeff, no answer to that? <laughs> well, Natalie's a journalist. And Jack, I just want to see what she says. <laughs> Natalie, are you, are you going to ask Julie? Yes. <laughs> uh, I, well, look, I'll just say that I think it's very interesting what's happened over the past couple weeks of a lot of these companies... And, and it does go, look, YouTube definitely started in 2005 with other people's content. I mean, there's no way around that. It's definitely what happened. And I have a whole other, I could do a seminar on the streaming wars about how we all got there in our own unique way. Um, it's very interesting on every company in that space, but they got there that way. And it's true. I think a lot of the data online was, was, was under, you know, was not put there understanding that this is how it was going to be used. And I definitely think that you can get caught upstream by an, uh, a large language model. Again, I don't think it's going to subsume all of search. I don't know what percentage of, of searches you're all doing that you, you do on ChatGPT or, or on Claude or anything else right now. But I think there's a use case for both. Um, but that has not been figured out. And I think, it's going to, I think it could be very interesting. I'm kind of downstream from that because we don't provide that service or something. We license it. Okay. That was a question here. Um, hi, Jim. Hi. Nice meeting you. Um, thanks for coming here today. My name is Emma. I'm also a MBA student here at Boyd Florida. So I believe many students here today in this room aspire to become a CEO for a multinational company one day. Jeez. So, <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Um, well, working backwards, I, I watch a lot of reality TV with Shannon and, and play with our dogs a lot now that you know, our youngest goes to boarding school, so we're empty nesters a little early. Um, and uh, I watch a lot of sports. But, um, but no, look, um, first of all, I honestly don't think you can ever plan to have this job. I never tried to have it. I didn't aspire to it. I love making products and I still love making products. I still think that's what I really do every day. And that's the way to generate growth in my industry. Again, I would be a terrible CEO of an enterprise software company or a Verizon or something. I am not qualified for that. Um, but I definitely know how to build this. And, um, and so, but you can't do everything yourself, right? Theory of the organization. If you look at an org chart, I can't do it all. So I have to then hire a team. But then, so they, then they can't do it all. Next thing you know, it's thousands of people. And, and if it's Apple or if it's Microsoft or, or Google or Amazon at this point, and now it's hundreds of thousands of people uh, to get these things done. Um, and so you can't, and, and then you realize you can't do everything yourself. You do only have a certain number of hours in the day, right? Reed Hastings used to say about Netflix, they're competing with time. <laughs> or sorry, they're competing with sleep. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing for a CEO's job, but I think any manager's job. I don't think my job is harder than one of my vice presidents who runs a division or runs a group. I mean, we all have a really stressful, hard job. It's just my job is more horizontal at this point, um, and theirs is more vertical for the thing they're trying to do. So I spend a lot of time with my team. So I have 12 direct reports who are official. I kind of have four floating at any given time just on transitions and businesses. So let's call it 16 people who need one-on-ones basically every week. Um, I have one with Apollo every week. I have one with my boss every week, the chairman. Um, and I mean, all those meetings takes a lot of time. I have external meetings with partners, people I want to have as partners, people pitching me on things, <laughs> bankers, if I'm raising money, you know, there's all these types of things. Um, there's appearances, you know, this is one. Tomorrow morning I'm recording a podcast. So there's kind of getting the word out. Um, 
if I can get all those things done and things are, are moving, and I always say that my first job is to set the machine up. And then eventually, it's kind of running by itself. <laughs> and, and then my job is just to kind of tweak the nodes. And, 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 and at that point, I don't have to change everything. I can just do kind of one thing at a time. If all that is going right, first of all, the job gets a lot easier. It's not 100 hours a week. It's going to be less. But at the beginning, it, it's a lot. And then eventually I can then go back to becoming the annoying product guy, <laughs> uh, sending in, you know, uh, screenshots of things and saying, what the hell is going on with this? <laughs> or saying in articles or, or I, you know, Y Combinator just had its, its uh, demo day and saying like, oh, did you guys see this one? And, you know, literally on the plane here, I was saying one to the guy who runs product for email because a competitor bought a messaging app and I have kind of some aspirations for, for that. And should we have bought that one? And, had that conversation. So I mean, you'd be surprised the white space of your day gets filled up with all these things. Plus you need to read and, and study. So that's why my hack for flights is also I've, is downloading videos on YouTube. I mean, I, I think I have 1,100 videos downloaded right now for flights <laughs> on everything, you know, so. Uh, thank you for being here. Yeah. Did you hear Bezos on Lex Friedman's podcast about the one-way door decisions and two-way door decisions? <laughs> He's, he, did you guys hear? That? Yeah. So I thought that was really interesting. I never thought of it that way before, which is um, he's fine letting his team kind of make run with things as long as he can back out of it later. But the ones he had to weigh in on were the one-way door, one door decisions that you could never <laughs> go back from. Um, you know, I don't know. I've never, I've never... I find making decisions one of the easiest things to do. Um, I think the hardest thing is having the right information to make the decision. <laughs> um, either because you have to generate it or just fog of war. But um, maybe that's because I started off with nothing as an entrepreneur and we, we just, we, you know, we were fighting for, for survival from day one and we kind of made something out of it. And so you just were trained from an early stage to kind of just go. So, um, so yeah, I kind of, I really actually like making hard decisions. I actually like tough times. I always say that I've said this before that some of the time to my team that some of the, when, when the shit hits the fan or some of the times we'll remember the most, you know, when we're like super stressed out and we don't know what's going to happen or trying to something existential that we had to work through, um, or we were in the office till three in the morning and we didn't know, you know, what was going to happen. Like those are some of the most memorable times you know, versus some launch that went really well or something. You kind of move on to the next one do you, with those. Do you find it tough at all knowing when to make that decision, the timing of the decision? Because some, you know, sometimes you, you want to delay, sometimes you want to make a quick decision. Do you, do you have any process for deciding? Now, you said, do you, for example, at yeah. the start, you spent several months sort of listening and learning before really doing anything. So. Do you find it challenging knowing when you should take that step of actually doing something? I think uh, maybe this is the benefit of having done it for so long that you could say I've been 27 years or something. Uh, you kind of develop to know when you need to speed up or slow down on that or when, when the moment you know, happened. Or, I mean, that's, that's the moment to go. I do find myself slowing the team down sometimes and, 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 and annoying them by they think I'm hemming and hawing, but really I'm just kind of trying to get more data and, and not fire till we see the whites of their eyes kind of a, a thing. Um, so I do, I agree, I actually think there is something to that, um, not being too hasty, but other times you gotta move. And uh, I, I'll actually say that I have learned that the more conservative decisions you make can really screw you over. Um, <laughs> like, I can just, th just right now, I just thought of three different examples of ones where we made the conservative decision and, you know, like we, we caught at, at Clicker, my internet TV, you know, search engine startup, we caught a major competitor scraping all of our results and putting them up on their site as if it was theirs. And the way we knew this is that <laughs> 
they were all marked, we, we, you know, they were hitting our site for all of these. And so, um, and so there was a decision internally of like, should we go, should we publicize this? Should we actually like go make some noise and call Kara Swisher and make a big deal out of this? Um, because Bill Gurley was like, he's a, he has a deep Southern accent. He's like, they just got caught respecting you. <laughs> and I was like, right, like we should go do it. And I listened to somebody else who said, no, no, let's use this to, to make sure we get a good partnership with that company. And in hindsight, we actually, it would have been way better to just go sing from the rooftops that these guys thought we were better than them. And it probably could have shifted a big, uh, I, I did kind of get back in a little bit. I changed every image on their site that they were scraping to our logo. <laughs> <laughs> so, and they didn't figure it out for like a day. Um, but, um, but you know, that, that's a small example, but I just think where you gotta make the bold decision, you know. Okay, I think we're almost out of time, but one, one last question. Someone over here. Okay, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, on that topic of search, it sh the, the phrase Google it, it should have been ask it. It's, it's more natural. But you would think so. <laughs> <laughs> so that speaks to Google's power, and they were just, everyone opted for them. So. Um, That's not exactly, well, that, that kind of is what happened. No, I, I honestly, our, our, our vision, for, our mission and vision for this is, is one and the same, which is that if you, if you take search out of it, what Yahoo has been since the day it launched was the trusted guide. It said it on the site. <laughs> it said always under construction. I promise you that our roadmaps now are thinking 10 years ahead. There's another 30 years of being the trusted guide. And if you're always under, under construction, then what that means from here's a website in a tree structure by category, to using AI to fold the universe on itself and just get that thing done for you autonomously, um, which is exactly where this is gonna head, and, and having a single pane of glass that is personalized to you for what it's gonna be, you wouldn't even know, what, you don't even have to know what Yahoo used to be to know what that, how useful that is. And the Yahoo brand has suffered over time and I don't know in your generation how much, because to your generation, it's probably got some vintage vibes to it that could be cool in a way if we can make the products good enough. Um, but to mine, it was beat up a lot for blowing it with search. But the thing you gotta realize is Yahoo never did search. They never had a search engine. They always licensed it. And in, 2000, in 1999 and 2000, there was no business model in search. It didn't happen until 2002. And and they had 17 banner ads on the search results page. Imagine using Google today with 17 banner ads because they were a public company with 10 other search engines that were public companies, including Ask, but InfoSeq and Excite and Lycos and all these things you guys have never heard of. They were all public. And, um, and they had to do that to survive, right? And so what happens? The market crashes um, in 2000. And they go, these Google guys, are, they, they do a bake-off between all of them, and they give it to Google. And, and to get a cheaper price, they go, well, we'll let Google have a logo on the page that links to Google. And in June of 2000, that's what they did. To, to, to do right by their users, to give them the best search engine they could, and to do it as cheaply as they could for their shareholders, they, they gave Google search. Which, pro I don't know if it ever would have happened if they, if, because if you had asked a person in 1999 to name a search engine, they would have said Yahoo. Um, now, Ask never had this chance because we were tiny. We almost went out of, we were being delisted when I joined in 2001. Uh, we had to fight back from that, you know, so that we never had the money to truly compete. And it was a structured data search engine. And if you asked it a question, had no idea how to give you the answer. <laughs> it was nothing like using a, a you know, chat GBT today. So that was never gonna happen either. Um, but so, you know, so, but if you take people who use Yahoo product today, Yahoo Sports, they have 30% higher, or they're 30% more likely to like the Yahoo brand. Yahoo Finance, same thing. Um, you know, Yahoo, uh, Yahoo Mail, same thing, 28 points higher. So the way, my way back on that front is to be great at what we do in these categories. We might add some categories and be that trusted guide to help you achieve your goals 
you know, not, no matter how big or small, we're not judging for what you're trying to do. Like, that's what we, we can just be focused on being, doing that really, really well. And then know that we don't have to be the trillion dollar company to win big here, right? We were bought for 5 billion. Like to be a really successful company and investment by our, by Apollo and others, we just have to be great at that. Like that's enough. Like I am, I'm into that. I can do that. <laughs> well, thank you, Jim. That's a, that's a great note to end on. And I, I, I'll say that, you know, one of our greatest assets as a school is our alumni and you're a fantastic example of that, not only in the success you've had in your career, but the support you've provided back to the school in so many different ways. And this is just one more example of that. So thank you so much for coming along again and answering all these great questions. Thank you. Thank you.